morning. Good morning. Uh, Jason, I really appreciated the story that you shared, and I got a good chuckle out of it. I too like to be funny, and I'm looking for someone to give me the um, like, when do you transition from like being funny to just like being the dad joke guy? Because I was preaching at my home church uh, a couple months ago, and I thought I was being really funny. And it got back to me that someone in the youth ministry, who I was the former youth minister of, was like, uh, all he did was dad jokes. Um, so I'm having a little bit of a crisis of confidence on what it is to be funny. Uh, I'm going to try to be a little bit funny in our sermon today, and you all can tell me if I'm just telling a bunch of dad jokes while we're up here. Um, it's so good to be with you uh, this morning. Our text comes from Matthew 11:25 through 30. At the time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Pray with me. God of grace, God who calls us your children, may your spirit be with us this morning. God, may we experience your grace and your love in ways that transform us more into the likeness of your son, Jesus. And may that transformation lead to the proclamation of your good news to this world, to our country, to our cities, to our neighborhoods, to our neighbors, so that they may know your love. We pray this in Christ's name and through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. In June of 2021, Andrew Choi released his fourth album, Ten Songs of Worship and Praise for Our Tumultuous Times, under the indie pop outfit St. Lennox. On the album, there is a song titled Gospel of Hope, and in the song, Choi consist consistently repeats, I'm not a religious man, but I can understand religion. And throughout the song, Choi reflects on moments in his life when even though he doesn't consider himself religious, the religious convictions of his family and childhood make sense and actually do the best job of accounting for his experience. And I love this line towards the end of the song. I don't know if I'm a religious man, but sometimes I still catch myself singing, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I think Choi's song beautifully communicates what one philosopher has called being haunted by belief. That is, even though we live in a culture that tries to convince us that meaning and purpose can be found in the materiality of life, we experience moments where we are reminded that there is more going on than we can see, hear, and touch. And for me, these are holy moments where I sense that heaven and earth aren't too far from each other. <clears throat> During the height of the pandemic, my family and I were doing what most of us were doing. We were going to church on Zoom. And during one of the services, my son, who was four at the time, started conducting our singing. Yeah. He would point to my wife and she would sing, and then he'd point at me and then I'd sing. It was as cute as some of you are imagining it this morning. And for me, it was one of those holy moments, one of those heaven-on-earth moments. Mm -hmm. To be honest, though, I almost missed it. Because for me, singing when and where people can hear me, even my own family, is a terrifyingly risky <laughs> and vulnerable moment for me. It is an experience of not letting my shame get the better of me. And to better understand what this is true for me, you need to understand Junior High Zach. Junior high Zach stood about five foot two, weighed about 100 pounds, soaking wet, and he rocked a mean bowl cut. <laughs> and Junior high Zach had a dream, and that dream was to be in a band. Now at the time, and honestly today, I still consider myself a little too punk rock to want to be in a rock star. 
Rather, I wanted to be a respectable band and a respectable band, which basically meant that I wanted to impress the young women at my school. <laughs> It's important to note at this point in my story that this dream was not based on any musical talent. I did not know how to play an instrument then, and I still do not know how to play one today. <laughs> still, I had so this dream, and so did some of my friends, and they actually had talent. So we formed a band, and we convinced our youth minister to let us play at the end of summer, summer pool party, and of course, I convinced my friends to let me be the lead singer. <laughs> Now, if you're thinking that this is one of those stories where everything works out at the end, it's not. <laughs> the big day came. We took the stage, and I'll paint the picture here. My friend Steven played drums, and so he was back here on drums, and uh, Chris, who would actually go on to play in a bunch of local death metal bands, uh, was on guitar over here to my right, and Mike, who I've known since I was uh, born, was on bass over here on the right. And they started playing the song that we had chosen to sing, and the moment came for me to sing, and... Nothing. I froze. My friends, recognizing that I had frozen and hoping that somehow I could rescue this, started the song over again. And again, the time came for me to sing, and... Nothing. Imagine with me just for a moment how I felt on that stage. The thing is, I didn't just feel embarrassed. I felt shame. I don't remember how things ended. I don't know how we got off the stage at all. But I do remember that feeling of shame. And so in situations where singing is involved, when I open my mouth, to sing, I can feel, find myself transported back to that stage in that moment, and all the shame that I felt comes rushing back in my voice will fall silent. What about you? Is there a moment like this that you can recall with clarity years later? Maybe it's the first time you risked and it didn't go well. Maybe it's the first time you experienced shame. For me, experiencing, or for me, singing where and when people can hear me is an extremely vulnerable moment. It's a risky moment. But here's the thing. If I don't choose to be vulnerable, if I don't choose to risk, then I'd miss that holy, heaven-drawn, near-to-earth moment with my wife and son on a Sunday. Amen. Dr. Brene Brown is a researcher on vulnerability and shame, and in her book, Daring Greatly, she writes this. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. Love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, creativity all sound awesome. I think all of us would like more of that in our lives. The problem is, is that they require vulnerability. And this is how Brown defines vulnerability. It is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. My guess is that that sounds a little less inviting to us, and I think one of the reasons is that we all have moments in our lives when choosing to move into uncertainty, choosing to risk, and becoming exposed emotionally turned out poorly. And those moments can turn into shame, which Brown defines as the intensely painful experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Our experiences of shame can make the idea of vulnerability seem like the worst possible option, right? The good news and bad news about shame is that we all have it, every single one of us. We've all experienced it. In fact, Brown's research has shown that the only people who don't experience shame are sociopaths. And so while I don't know all of you here this morning, I'm fairly certain that making the claim that we have all experienced shame is true. We've all had that painful experience of believing that our flaws make us unworthy of love and belonging. And those experiences can shape us and can lead us to create false lives and worship false gods. Shame can drive us to worship the idol of perfection, 
So we seek to be the perfect man, the perfect woman, the perfect husband, the perfect wife, the perfect mother or father, the perfect employee, the perfect son or daughter, the perfect brother or sister, and the perfect friend. In order to learn the love and belonging we are created to enjoy. Shame tells us that we aren't enough and we don't deserve love. Shame tells us that we shouldn't share that opinion or confess that sin. Because if we do, well then they probably won't like us very much. And we all need friends. Shame can drive us into addiction because we want to find ways to avoid the fear and pain of rejection. And then our addiction drives us further into shame. Shame is a heavy burden for us to carry. Brown suggests that we overcome shame by believing that we are worthy of love and belonging and then practicing that belief by choosing to be vulnerable people. And I want to suggest this morning that the only way we can truly be vulnerable people is when we come to and learn from Jesus. Which is why it's important for us to hear Jesus' invitation in Matthew 11, 25-30. We need to keep in mind that for Matthew, Jesus is the continuation of the story of Israel. And so Matthew uses language that if we have the ears to hear, will remind us of the story of Exodus and the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. The come to me and learn from me language here in our text this morning echoes the invitation to study the wisdom literature of the Old Testament in books like the Proverbs. It's important for us to keep in mind that wisdom literature was meant to deepen the relationship between Israel and God by integrating that relationship into the fabric of ordinary life. That is, wisdom literature isn't meant for the ivory, to ivory towers of academia, but for the day in and day out grind of our everyday lives. The people of Israel understood that every moment of their life was meant to be lived considering their relationship with God, which is one of the reasons why the law of Moses is so exhaustive. For example, the dietary laws of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible may seem odd to us, but if we keep in mind that they helped Israel recognize God's presence in their lives everywhere and in every moment, they might begin to seem a little less odd. And we might even begin to see some familiarity. For example, the practice of praying before meals, right, helps us remember God's presence and grace in our lives. My point is that Jesus' words here are not meant to simply be known and memorized. Rather, they are meant to be shaped the way we live our everyday lives as any good piece of wisdom should. Jesus' language in our text this morning also notes his close relationship to God and echoes the special relationship Moses shared with the Lord in the Exodus story. Scholar Patricia Sharbar, commenting on the text, writes this, Like the relationship between Moses and God, the relationship between Jesus and God is unique and not private. It is for the sake of the people who will accept him. Even though sin and rejection cause disturbance of the relationship between the people and God, Jesus, like Moses, stands on the side of the people, mediating at great risk to himself on behalf of them before God. Our text this morning reminds us that Jesus is for us. Jesus is on our side. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our salvation. And it is a call or an invitation to a life of wisdom. So that we might live in God's kingdom. It is an invitation to live a particular way, and I suggest this morning that particular way is to be vulnerable people. To be people who choose risk, move into uncertainty, and be emotionally exposed because it is there we experience love, joy, creativity, authenticity, and accountability. How do we become people who make this choice? We come to Jesus and learn. We come to Jesus and learn that the God who created the world loves us so much that God sends Jesus so that we could learn to live an abundant life now and into forever. We come to Jesus to learn what an abundant life really is. We come to, to Jesus and learn that throughout history, God has continued to pour out his unsteadfast love, first through the law and now through the life, death, death resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We come to Jesus and learn that our deepest need for belonging is met in him. 
And that our belonging is not contingent on our ability to be perfect, but on the unending and dynamic grace of Jesus Christ. I like how theologian Douglas Otani puts it. You may have received the impression or even heard people say that to have worth you must compete and achieve and succeed. You may have encountered the idea that in order to be worthy or even to justify yourself, you need to make money and be recognized as an accomplished professional. But don't believe it. By the light of the very good news of the gospel and the strange logic of grace alone, you have worth in God's sight, whether or not you turn out to be a recognized success. As a minister, I have found myself over the years thinking and researching a lot about what is taking place in our culture. And one of the things that I have become convinced of is that we live in a culture that so often defines success by our ability to consume Right? We've been taught that our belonging is based upon our ability to buy the newest and best thing. We've been taught that our ethics can and should be sacrificed on the altar of more. More money, more sex, more fame. And so I think we need to be reminded over and over and over again that God's love and our work, our human dignity is not tied to achievement, but rooted in the good news of the gospel and the strange logic of grace alone. Which is why it's so important for us to gather as faithful followers of Jesus and be reminded of this good news weekly. I think that this is the easy yoke Jesus is inviting us to pick up. This is the light burden Jesus offers in exchange for our shame. And because we are dealing with wisdom this morning, we need to think about how this easy yoke, this light burden, shapes our lives. Before we do that, though, I think we need to pay attention to the burdens of shame that Jesus invites us to bring to him. Because shame is a powerful force in our lives. The fear of disconnection and not being lovable drives us to do all kinds of things in order to overcome it. One of the ways we do this, right, one of the ways we try to overcome our shame is by trying to earn our acceptance and love. We trick ourselves into thinking that if we become more successful business people, drive the right car, take the right vacations, vote the right way, eat the right food, exercise enough, lose enough weight, look a particular way, then, then we will find the acceptance and love we desperately need. But here's the thing. Here's what I'm convinced of. We know on some deep level that that is all garbage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 2013, Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player to ever play the game, sorry if you like LeBron James. <laughs> Not uh, in 2013, Jordan turned 50, and ESPN interviewed him as his birthday approached. And what is striking about the article is that even with all the success Jordan had on the court, all the money and fame and the things that he's been able to buy over the years, the picture we're offered is of a man who is struggling to find meaning in life. Even the title of the article in play implies the unsettled life Jordan lives. It was titled, Michael Jordan Has Not Left the Building. In the article, Wright Thompson, the interviewer, observes this. Back in the office after his vacation on a 154-foot rented yacht named Mr. Terrible, Jordan feels that relaxation slipping away. He feels pulled inward toward his most valuable and destructive traits. Slights roll through his mind, eating at him. Worst record ever. Can't build a team. Absentee landlord. Jordan reads the things written about him, the fuel arriving in a packet of clips his staff prepares. He knows what people say. He needs to know. A needle for a hungry bank. That's a palpable sim simmering wherever you're around Jordan, as if Air Jordan is still in there, churning, <laughs> trying to escape. It must be strange to be locked in combat with the ghost of your former self. Arguably, Jordan has achieved all there is to achieve in basketball. He rents 154-foot yachts, and he previously owned an NBA franchise, and he has his staff put together packets of all the negative things people say about him. <laughs> Jordan isn't satisfied. He isn't at peace because the idol of more never leads us to peace. 
That's right. And there are plenty of other stories like Jordan that remind us of what we know. Lives spent in pursuit of more are always lives that fall short of meeting our deepest need. But there is a difference between knowing and living something. Which is why it's important that we understand that Jesus' invitation is a life of wisdom. And yet, we often spend so much of our time pursuing hopes and uh, pursuing these other things in hopes that somehow we're wrong and they do actually lead to the acceptance and love we want. Why is that? I think it's possible we do this because the alternate is too scary for us. We're afraid of the uncertainty, risk, and exposure that vulnerability requires of us. It's easier, honestly, to chase money, sex, fame, and perfectionism, and the many other ways we try to earn acceptance and love. It is possible that while we believe the good news of God's unending love for us, in practice we fail to live out of this truth. That is, we fail to trust this good news and orient our lives around it. Which is why it's important, again, to, for us to hear Jesus' in invitation to come and learn, and to hear this invitation as a way to live in the world. My suggestion is that one of the ways we can do this is by becoming honest storytellers. For the past, uh, well, for about eight years, I had the privilege of teaching um, roughly 30 to 40 undergraduate students the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible every semester. And one of the aspects that I try to emphasize with my students is that one of the reasons I think the Old Testament is trustworthy is that it is honest. Too often, I think we read the Hebrew Bible Old Testament through the lens of discovering the moral of the story. And so we treat complex stories as if they're Aesop fables. The problem with this kind of reading is that it can keep us from seeing and hearing the Word of God in transformative ways as we wrestle with the complexity of the text. It's not uncommon at some point during a semester for students to come to me and ask a, a question, something along the lines of, um, why did God choose such flawed people? And underlying the question is the realization that Abraham, Jacob, Saul, David, and the rest of the people in the Hebrew Bible are extremely flawed humans. And I take great comfort in this. Because the point of the Hebrew Bible isn't to provide morals, but to provide but rather to provide a testimony of flawed people about the graciousness of God's steadfast love in their lives. Amen. What is amazing to me is that the authors of the Hebrew Bible refuse to edit out the sins and flaws of their biggest heroes. When Israel tells its history, they tell all of it, the good, the bad, and the extremely ugly. For example, Psalm 106 is a historical song. The song is one of vulnerable confession. It sings, we sin, right along with our ancestors. We've done what is wrong. We've acted wickedly. Toward the end of the song, toward the end, the song shifts towards hope as the psalmist sings, God remembered his covenant for their sake. And because of how much faithful love he has, God changed his mind. Israel, in exile, chose to be vulnerable people. They chose to be honest storytellers, to confess their wrongdoing and their sin, and trust in God's faithful love. They came to God with their heavy burden of shame, with the hope that the yoke of God would be light. And it's important that we keep in mind that there is a difference between shame and guilt. Shame is the painful experience of believing we are unworthy of love and belonging. In other words, shame is the belief that I am a bad person. Guilt is the recognition that something we've done is wrong and we need to seek forgiveness. In other words, I did a bad thing. We need guilt in our lives. We need the, abil the ability to understand that our sin affects our lives and those around us. When I sin, I need to be able to recognize my sin, feel guilty, seek forgiveness and reconciliation. Brown's research actually shows that guilt is a positive influence in our lives. Uncomfortable, to be sure, but positive. Jesus' invitation is not a promise that we will be free from guilt. Rather, when we rooted ourselves in Christ, we find the ability not to let our guilt turn into shame. 
We find the courage to confess our sins because we trust that regardless of whether we are at our best or at our worst, God loves us. When we live from this place, when we understand that we are loved and known in Christ, then we become people who can be vulnerable. We can feel guilt, confess, and seek forgiveness, trusting that our sins do not define us because we know that our belonging is not tied in our ability to be perfect. We can confess and trust that when we are at our very worst, Jesus is there offering words of love, forgiveness, and grace. We hear Jesus saying to us, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to hear, believe, and live these words. We need to bring our heavy burdens of shame and sin to Jesus. We need to learn that we are loved and created by a loving God who has loved us and continues to love us. And we need to hear, believe, and live these words. We need to be able to be vulnerable people because we live in a world burdened by shame and in desperate need of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, the question is this, will we come and learn, or are we trapped in the game of war in comparison? Are we creating false lives and pursuing false gods? Come to Jesus and learn. Are we letting shame run and ruin our lives? Are we convinced that we are unworthy of belonging and love? Come to Jesus and learn. And as we come, and as we learn, may we become vulnerable people who know that in Christ we find love and belonging. May we be people who offer love and belonging to the stranger, the enemy, the friend, and all those who live in the margins. Because our world, our nation, our states, our cities, our neighborhoods, and our workplaces need to hear the good news that the God who creates all things is the God who loves, sustains, and seeking the restoration of all things. May mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Pray with me. God, we are grateful that you love us. That our worth, that who we are, is not rooted in our ability to compete, our ability to consume, our ability to get more. But rather, our worth is tied directly to the fact that you created us for you that in Christ we find our identity. And God, this is the good news. This is the good news you call us to share. That people are loved, not because of what they do, but because of who they are. Created by you, for you, out of love. God, may we, your people, be vulnerable with each other, trusting the good news about ourselves. And may our examples of vulnerability invite others into the abundant life that you created. I pray this in Christ's name through the Spirit.